Michael Real, Constantina Banya, Mikhail Harver. Very warm welcome to the Digital Markets Research Hub. Today we will be discussing the topic which is of paramount significance, both in terms of designing digital markets and uh, from purely juristic point of view, namely the recent statement of objections uh, by the Commission uh, sent to Google for its ad tech industry abuse, alleged abuse of, of dominance. Um, the, the case is very interesting uh, on several reasons. First of all, because the very industry is somehow, is, we all understand that it's a, the place where the digital power is being converted into a monetary pecuniary power, but also because of the unprecedented structural remedies proposed by the Commission at such early stage or suggested uh, by the Commission. So we have plenty of interesting issues to discuss, and I'm very pleased that you have agreed to, to join this panel because you all have commented on, the, on, on these matters well, well before it became so popular and topical. So while we all somehow understand the main elements of programmatic advertising, advertising industry, its importance for the, for the economy, for digital markets, I propose we start the first round with just reminding ourselves the main me mechanism, the main elements uh, or, or, of, of this industry. So, M Mikhail, uh, why, why wouldn't you start with, with outlining the main elements and the importance? Okay, Th thank you, Alice. I'm happy to try and do that. It's uh, taking on this difficult exercise of, of summarizing ad tech, uh, given its complexity. Uh, just before I do that, a quick word of, uh, on disclosure, because I think that's important. I've been advising many companies adverse to Google, and in particular in ad tech, um, including the, 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 in the context of the, the French decision that was issued a couple of years back, um, which was the first decision in, in ad tech. Um, so now that this is uh, sort of out of the way, so um, ad tech is about, um, you know, sort of all display advertising that is not on on and operated uh, properties. So for example, Facebook, so you can leave out Facebook, you can leave out Twitter, things like that, and also forget about search. And then it's going to be all the rest, essentially. So virtually any website um, and any advertisement on, on websites. And AdTech refers to the, to the intermediaries um, <clears throat> that are used by publishers to sell their inventory and advertisers to buy uh, inventory. And you have three key layers to, to simplify, you have ad buying tools that are used as you can expect by uh, advertisers, ad selling tools used by publishers to sell their inventory and ad exchanges in the middle. And demand and supply will meet in sort of real time, at, you know, in auctions typically happening really at, at light speed. And you can have many auctions for a single, when you load a page, many, uh, auctions can happen at the same time uh, in, and in real time. So the thing is, Google is active at each layer. And um, the, the commission preliminary finds that Google is dominant on both sides. So on the tools used by advertisers and the tools used by publishers. And um, so Google will be essentially organizing uh, and participating in auctions. And you can already see how this can raise issues around conflicts of, of interest, uh, especially in a market that is so complex and, and, and opaque. So this is the essence. I think that the notion of conflicts of interest is a recurring theme and it, it kind of encapsulates probably the, the, the issues here. And then you have other type of, I mean, flowing from these issues around self-preferencing uh, um, along, along the way, along this. So just to, to, to sort of finish, why, why does it matter? Taking a step back even, um, we, we've seen, you know, change of padding in uh, digital advertising. So before it was more contextual advertising. So the content would be the basis for targeting. So for example, the, exam the, the example I like is, you know, you would have, I don't know, a, say a fishing road in a fishing magazine just because the content would be the, the, the basis for targeting. And then we moved away from this, and now we have programmatic advertising, which since essentially means that because you have uh, access to, to user data, it doesn't really matter where you place the ad. You could place your fishing road advert in on an article on, uh, I don't know, uh, Manchester City winning the, the Champions League, uh, uh, just because you have data on the user, and you know that the user likes uh, fishing as well as football. 
So, and, and, and the important thing from this is that, and the economic implication is that the value that was held by content producers is not, is held now by those having targeting capabilities and access to data, which, you know, where Google and Facebook probably play an essential role. So that, that's why it, it matters so much. And an even broader context would be that, um, we know publishers have been struggling uh, financially, so if they can't really monetize their content, it will reduce and undermine their ability to, to invest in quality content. Uh, part of publishers, you have news publishers, we know how important news publishers and quality, uh, the press quality of quality is important to our democracy and society in general. And then if advertisers pay more, you you can also, also have uh, issues of, of pass on uh, in terms of advertisers passing on the higher cost onto uh, end consumers. Um, and, and the last sort of, uh, uh, sort of source of harm would be on, on rivals, uh, obviously. And I'm just mentioning those three types of harm because it's, it's also mentioned in the, in the commission uh, statement of objection or in the press release at least saying that everyone uh, could have been harmed along the way. And that is not straightforward uh, as, a, as an economic principle. You could imagine that if advertisers pay more, then publishers receive more. So, uh, uh, but, but that's not the case apparently according to the, to the EC. I actually remember in one of your comment, uh, comments on, 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 on French Google case, you mentioned that that was one of the counter arguments that, that, that actually publishers in, in one segment of the markets might be better off at some point, but let, let, let us maybe talk about this a little bit later. Constantina, how do you see this, the, 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 this conundrum? It is indeed a conundrum. Uh, so perhaps I should start by uh, uh, making one quick remark for the sake of transparency. So as you know, I'm partner at Jehadan Partners. I'm also senior lecturer in law at Brunel University. Jehadan Partners has been involved in the complaint of the European Publishers Council against Google, and we will be talking about the statement of objection shortly. However, I have not been involved in the case, and any of you should be attributed to me and me only today. So uh, getting that out of the way, uh, I think that all this, this is a very interesting time to discuss this issue. Um, and it, if you really think about it, it's always been important to discuss this issue because uh, we as consumers have been used to consuming content online for free. However, uh, publishers need to monetize the content they provide somehow. So what I'm trying to say is that this is a fundamental problem of the digital economy that is still in search of a solution. And it's mind boggling if you really think about it because there have been many antitrust uh, cases uh, in the area, but up until recently, we haven't seen competition authorities really touch upon the complexities of digital advertising. So of course, we will be discussing about the different cases today, including uh, the CMS privacy sandbox case and uh, the commission statement of objections. We know that there is a case ongoing in the the US also with a lawsuit filed by the DOJ against Google. And so there's lots going on in the area. And this is, uh, uh, so these are exciting times to discuss this issue, but it's also an issue that needs to be addressed sooner, sooner than later because um, uh, we can only see things getting worse in my, in my view. Uh, we uh, see the profitability of Google and we also see publishers and how their income has been affected over the past years, uh, um, arguably as a result of these practices. I just wanted to point out that this is one of the uh, most complex value chains that exist, I mean, or at least the, <laughs> one of the most complex that I have seen. And, and it's also worth pointing out that there are many other um, players in between. Uh, so for example, we have consent or data management platforms. We have um, uh, uh, companies that, spe uh, that specialize in verification uh, of ad campaigns. So we have all these new players that uh, gradually emerge and offer complementary services. Uh, in addition, of course, to the um, adds uh, to the buying side and the sell side. Thank you very much, Constantina. Michael, now we, we, we heard the, econo the, the, the perspective on, on the industry, the reflection on the, on the development of the industry from competition econ economist and from competition lawyer. Now we have a, an opportunity to hear from this kind of a little bit broader, more, more theoretical maybe a uh, perspective from legal tech uh, expert. Um, how do you see this, uh, this development? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, disclosure is that I, I don't really know about competition law, um, but, the, yeah, but but I do know a lot about uh, technology law and um, data privacy law, and um, and real time bidding in general is something that I've studied for many years and been uh, very involved in as an academic, focusing on this space. 
And one thing to note about real-time bidding uh, is firstly, it's not a very old technology. It's not the way we've been doing advertising on the web forever. It's about 10 years old. So it's not an inevitability, right? It is not the only way to monetize you know, adverts online by far. And we don't really have a great deal of um, evaluation or monitoring data on how it compares to other Thomas advertising that we can trust that it's from impartial sources. We also know that intermediaries and the, the large number of intermediaries in the supply chain take a very large proportion of the money in the supply chain. Um, and they don't always have a strong interest in creating faithful evaluation of how effective advertising is. So there are a lot of accusations in the space that this is a, a, an industry that is built on significant amounts of incorrect information about the functioning of adverts. The financial flows are, are confusing and therefore maybe our normal um, economic logics don't always apply as cleanly in this situation because this is an area of heavily as asymmetrical information in the market. Um, in an air, in, and people who work in this space are also constrained by the kinds of tools that they use, which, as we noted by the previous speakers, are provided by players like Google and don't always allow good interrogation of all of the assumptions in the supply chain or um, evaluation in a very robust way. And, um, and the complexity of the supply chain is something which is also um, you know, confusing to people in this industry. So the, it is not the case that people within the industry have a great view of where their money is going. Indeed. Um, some of you may be aware of the um, the research that was uh, done by PwC in 2020, which uh, illustrates that there is uh, effectively um, a 15% of the spend that goes between advertiser and publisher that no one really knows where it goes. <laughs> it's like that. And so, you know, in this point, you, know, you could say, well, you've already got a lot of intermediaries there. If targeting is very effective, it has to be very effective in order to get rid of this gigantic spend that you're losing in intermediaries. So there's a lot of um, interesting spaces, things going on in this area. And um, one thing I'd say in relation to data and, and privacy law in, in this its area is this is an industry which has not had very much enforcement, but is structurally really incompatible with data protection law. Not all advertising and target advertising is. Um, but this is an industry where every time you go to a website, personal data, often very, very sensitive personal data, is being uh, broadcast to hundreds, if not more, actors at once with very little control. Um, under a, the, and it's forced to use a basis of consent. And consent is, in practice, impossible to get because you cannot consent to 300 things at once. Like here, this is so there are structural incompatibilities with this and data protection law, and there have been for a long time. And this is not the only way to operate an advertising system. And so we think of a lot through competition law, but I think we, firstly we have to think about the alternatives. One of the challenges of the alternatives is the alternatives on the table at Privacy Sandbox are being you know proposed by the infrastructural actors, and we cannot divorce them from the fact that we have a, a, a kind of very strong and concentrated market of infrastructural providers as well that can provide alternatives. Um, and and the, uh, the, we also have to realize, I think, that the ad tech industry at the moment is not a particularly innovative industry insofar as it cannot shift very effectively to a new business model. You know, in this complex supply chain, actors are quite stuck as rule takers within this supply chain. And because they do not have an infrastructure which they can use to flip to providing targeting through a different mechanism or so on, um, then they are really uh, tethered to this model, which is, is often illegal under data protection law and, and privacy law, and, and also perhaps consumer law as well. And so I think this is an interesting space that, um, and a bit of a trap that these, these ad tech players find themselves in, and therefore we don't always get a very faithful view of the potential options because everyone is trying to consider only the options that keep their personal quite limited business in, in play. Indeed. And I think we will, re we will revert to some components which you have highlighted uh, in, 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 in this conversation. Mikhail, let us revert now to, uh, to the statement of objections itself. Uh, the Commission goes quite uh, um, um, or proactively uh, identifying uh, several layers or basically three uh, uh, la layers of harm, the harm for, for, for competing providers of advertising technology services, for advertisers, and for online publishers. So it's it's not a reductionist approach. It's kind of a, a, an attempt to make it a little bit more, not if not comprehensive, then at least very, very wide and ambitious. Can you uh, highlight the, the substance of, of SO? Yes, I can try. Although I haven't seen the SO, uh, but yeah, I think that what is, I mean, what I can say, and what I find, um, I mean, a couple of things are, are interesting, I think that, so, uh, 
another word of context is that, um, okay, we have the French decision that was dealing with issues on the publisher side. So really between the uh, ad selling tools and the exchanges, uh, not really looking at what was happening on the advertiser side. And now the commission is dealing with both. Um, and I think it's, at, so first, well, sort of squaring the circle in a sense, because also addressing the issues on, on uh, what's going on on advertisers and whether advertisers are harmed. Uh, you're right, uh, unless you reminded that, that indeed the, the French um, um, uh, regulate, the competition authority also had to look at effects on advertisers in a sense that uh, sometimes the defense of Google was to say, well, there is an objective justification for this conduct, because although it may harm say competitors it's good for publishers or it's good for advertisers so to the extent that they had to sort of uh, address a possible objective justification defense the, the the fca the french authority had to look into these issues but i think otherwise the the the, the, the commission's case is much broader um uh, which is which is uh welcome um and um you know, Constantina, honestly, also to you mentioned it's important to act fast, and it could have been one of the reasons why the the, the, the French decided to focus on some aspects uh, that they found maybe most concerning, rather than dealing with all the issues, because given the complexity of the market. So that that's also uh, I think I think some, something uh, you know interesting um, in in the development. But you know, the Commission now coming. Um, after the, the, the French authorities saying, well, I'm gonna look at the same issues and, and also more, is interesting because some remedies have been offered in France. So you wonder, are these remedies effective? And of course the remedies offered in France were behavioral remedies, but these remedies were to be applied or have been allegedly, we don't really know what these remedies are, because, but applied worldwide. Um, in spite of this, the commission coming after saying, well, um, uh, I'm going to look at the same issues. So it seems as if they got it wrong, or at least the, the remedies offered were not sufficient. And also saying, well, you tried behavioral remedies, but I think at this point that structural remedies are necessary is an interesting development. Uh, probably even more so after the, the EC med uh, headlines. Uh, for its very pragmatic approach in Microsoft Activision, I think this that that that's also an interesting terms of, of approach. So that's sort of a, the the always the conundrum here is to look at effects on all sides, and it, it, it seems as if the Commission has done that um, <clears throat> and uh, reached the conclusion that everyone was harmed. And just going back to what I was saying, you know, typically you may think there is a bit of a uh, a, a tension because if advertisers pay more. Uh, or uh, then publishers may get more uh, and vice versa. Uh, of course, the story is completely different if the intermediaries are retaining a higher share in some way. So that's the first effect. That's the first reason uh, why you can have sort of aligned incentives or aligned harm on both sides. And the second economic reason is that if, um, if you prevent efficient matching of uh, advertisers and publishers, you also have a dead loss in a sense that if you have an ad space, there is typically someone who's willing to pay more for this space because there is a high interest, a high valuation. If you prevent this because you prevent someone from bidding or participating in the auction because you would rather win it yourself, even though it's less efficient because your valuation is less, uh, then it creates a dead loss at constant take rates. So that is also uh, uh, why you can have, to give you the intuition as to why you can have harm on all sides when you can't have this ideal situation where you would like to have all like demand and supply meeting in a single auction and to make sure that you have this efficient allocation of, a, of, a, of demand and supply of impressions to the, to the, best, to the best bidder. So that's also quite, quite key to, to keep in mind from an economic perspective. Thank you, Mikhail. Constantina, what are your views on, on, on this? 
Well, uh, where do I start <laughs> to begin with? Uh, I think that uh, the case is very interesting for uh, for many different reasons. Uh, first of all, as Mikael said, uh, this is slightly different from the French case. However, we should also point out that, you know, it wasn't only the French that dealt with this issue. This issue around conflicts of interest has arisen and has been dealt with by competition authorities around the world. For example, the CMA market study that we've all read, I mean, deals with the issue of conflicts of interest and how uh, Google has essentially um, uh, expanded into all segments of the market. Uh, and that's one of the main concerns that the CMA discusses. And this is something that we will arguably see addressed by um, uh, the upcoming bill. Uh, so this is definitely, I mean, the, the, the concerns that arose, the concerns that are discussed are definitely far from new. In fact, I think Google in its previous release or, uh, regarding the statement of objections mentioned, well, this is something that we saw in the past. Now, going to the issue of remedies and how the commission approaches this issue, I think that there are two different uh, points to discuss. Uh, in addition to the point raised by Mikhail regarding, you know, the French competition authority decision and the commitments imposed on Google or made legally binding on Google. First of all, I cannot think of a case where, you know, progress or high profile a case in, in this area where uh, progress on behavioral remedies uh, was monitored and discussed extensively by the European Commission. And, and I think we need to remind ourselves of the tools that are available in competition law, right? So essentially a competition authority can always go back to the remedies in addition to monitoring, of course, compliance with the remedies, but it can also go back and say, well, perhaps uh, we got this wrong or this is not working the way it's supposed to be working and therefore let's change the obligations this is something that can be done i cannot think of a case where this was actually done especially in such a fast moving market so that's one point to consider with respect to behavioral remedies and um, as michael pointed out i mean with respect to the french case we really don't know how you know this whole issue of compliance with behavioral remedies evolved in in, in a way because the decision was adopted in 2021, so it's been two years since the decision was adopted. And then, of course, we shouldn't forget about the other very important development on the other side of the Atlantic, the DOJ lawsuit. And of course, the DOJ explicitly mentions and requests in its lawsuit, it requests the court to impose structural remedies on Google because there is no other uh, solution, according to the DOJ, that can resolve the problems that were identified throughout its investigation. So I think this also prompted the commission um, uh, to essentially uh, go for uh, 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 you know, a reference to structural remedies in the press release. Uh, a, had it not, uh, had there not been a reference to structural remedies in uh, in the DOJ lawsuit, I'm not sure whether the commission would have been um, as as bold as to say something along those lines. So uh, I think that uh, it's also important to to to, to consider uh, uh, the developments on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, one other thing with respect to behavioral remedies, um, because you know, and the allegations over self preferencing. I'm a bit tired uh, of hearing that, you know, self-preferencing is a novel practice in competition law and Google Shopping was the first case that dealt with this issue. And I even saw somewhere on LinkedIn, self-preferencing is the only time that we see commission, the commission refer to self-preferencing in a press release, a statement of objections. Oh, well, wait a minute, because in competition law, we also have merger control. And there, when you discuss vertical mergers or concerns around vertical integration, you have theories of harm around self-preferencing being developed all the time. And in fact, when a merged entity is required to grant access on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms, that's essentially a way to avoid self-preferencing. So all this, you know, discussion around whether this amounts to an antitrust uh, law infringement, I'm, I'm not buying into it. Thank you, Constantina. Michael, how do you understand for, uh, you, you, you look at, at the development of the technology from, from mainly data protection point of view, but broader as well. Do you think such proposals, such, uh, such proposed remedy uh, as divestiture, would they be able to, would such remedy be able to recalibrate significantly or qualitatively the, the, the way how the industry is functioning, or it will only have some incremental maybe improvement, despite being so radical in, 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 its, in its ambition? I think it will only you know, have quite incremental changes. Um, you know, in part, this industry has been changing for a long time, not just in response to Chrome's uh, deprecation or the pro's deprecation of cookies or or um, uh, or the changing nature of the markets. There's been many, many changes in this entire industry. But one thing I'd point to is that uh, Google in particular has 
power through so many different pathways, through control of its web engine uh, that powers Google Chrome, but also powers Microsoft Edge and powers um, Brave and powers Vivaldi and powers the you know, vast majority of web browsers around the world. Um, through its uh, control of the Android ecosystem, through complex contractual arrangements with both manufacturers, and also through effective control of the code base, through its dominance of web standards and forums in ITF and W3C, which shape the kinds of advertising that can and cannot be uh, produced. Um, uh, so the, this is we got a wide variety of powers, and there are more and more they can draw upon from JavaScript libraries we've seen in in in, um, in mobile uh, mobile web frameworks for development of mobile um, mobile sites, for example. And the list goes on. Google has effectively accumulated a toolbox of potential power, and hasn't deployed even a fraction of it yet. And so the options this company has for moving in any single direction are effectively rummaging through its toolbox and seeing which way it wants to move. It is a much more flexible understanding than we have, and it's much more about potential. So it's very hard to understand this because you know, I don't think competition law has a very good grasp with potential technical power. You know, it's got quite a good grasp to say, hey, we've got these different actors that have these different double roles, but it's very hard to say, well, if they wanted to, they would have significant control of that standard, or if they wanted to, because these are often quite complex social relations, technical relations, you know, quite arcane, potential power that has not been exhibited very clearly yet. And that's why I think this needs to be a bit more ambitious. You know, the Digital Markets Act is, for example, quite a nice start. It's still quite basic, but I think it has to, um, it has to grapple with some of these potential powers and have to open up uh, these discussions. When we look at areas at Privacy Sandbox, I know we'll be talking about a bit later on. Um, you, I think one of these Areas you can't divorce this from the concentrated browser market and the lack of actual discussion about uh, what we can run on the web and with whose permission. So, a lot of these challenges, um, I'm not so convinced it will be. Uh, these will be giant, uh, giant shifts indeed. Um, but I'm looking forward to seeing um, you know the the kinds of analysis that the commission will have to do when it's going to be be analysing these different, very entangled layers. And hopefully it will actually get deep into the control of standards, the control of operating systems, um, and realize that they can't stay at the surface level and treat these like a lot of services just sort of sit alongside each other. But actually they are joined together infrastructurally by quite powerful entwined threads. Um, and that will need, um, I mean, a lot more than I think traditional competition or tools in order to uh, untangle that. Um, and it will need quite a lot of creativity to do that. And I'm not, as a non-competition non -competition lawyer or economist, you know, very knowledgeable about how likely it is they can do that. But as somebody who studies this ecosystem closely, um, I hope they are able to make progress. Thank you very much, Michael, for this uh, very um, maybe disappointing or realistic, let's say, perspective. I remember your intervention at, at a recent event at, at Ventham House uh, conference. You, you were one of, of, of very few contributors who were rather kind of not skeptical, I would say, again, I would say realistic about this, you know, excitement, how, how much we can change because we, we, deal, we, we face only a, a tiny fraction of, of all the potential power which, the, which, which all digital ecosystems uh, accumulate constantly and scale, scale it up. Let us move now to the, to the uh, ex ante elements, Mikhail. Um, do you think the, this cascade of legislation uh, introduced recently and be, which is being considered now by the European by the European Union is capable to change to change the dynamics on, in this market of, of competition in this market yeah that's um well I mean by itself no <laughs> that's not my short answer it could be complementary I think that what Michael said was very interesting in terms of uh, uh, transparency and um, and why so the problem of opacity and lack of transparency means that of course we can more much more easily uh, engage in uh, nefarious conduct because people can't see that but but also then it won't trigger switching uh, across uh, you know across different providers and even rivals from Google might say well actually we can deliver value but we can't prove that. So, so there is a strong link, obviously, with competition. And given that the market is evolving very uh, quickly, and what Michael is saying is we might be in the past already, we are, may not be able to solve everything. We know competition is a very uh, you know, strong tool to actually 
uh, uh, move with the market. So if we can promote competition, it could solve the issue. That, that's one way of doing it. How do you do this? Well, increasing transparency would be, would be a good area for the DMA because it's not directly related to competition itself, but we want to make sure that the market is a bit more transparent. That, that, that's the fir first comment. Um, another one that I think is that, you know, with these regulatory tools coming in, you could have expected the commission being a bit more uh, confident that uh, behavioral remedies could be monitored and, um, you know, we could, so it's, it's also, yeah, I think it's not worth it to see the commission uh, saying, well, we still need structural remedies despite these new regulatory tools that we have. And if you look at the CMA, for example, they had the market study and, um, and indeed, Constantina, you touched about you know, the market study. And in the market study already at the time, the CMA was considering structural remedies well, alongside other remedies. But they, they, they were exactly saying, maybe we need to you know, cut uh, the stack uh, in half, either on the advertiser side or on the publisher side. So it's not completely new. The CMA was saying, we might need to do that. At the time, they were kind of passing the baton to, to the DMU that was coming. Uh, and then the CMA thought, well, actually, we'll have an antitrust investigation instead. They must have realized that it won't be sufficient. So I would say these can be complementary because we, we need more, as Michael said. So um, maybe structural remedies and then on the back of this, having regulatory tools to make sure that we build. I think my key recommendation would be to build uh, you know, a, a good understanding of, of these markets. We are starting to have a good understanding of this market and then move with the market a bit more rapidly, not having to do like two years of market study and then three years of, a, of, a, of an investigation to start understanding. If we have the DMA with hiring technologists and data scientists as a key recommendation to have people really able to do what Michael is doing with, with, with others, but just look into disaggregated data, have a deep understanding and then uh, uh, help uh, uh, you know understand already what the problem is, so that you can't get away with any kind of conduct because it's going to be out in the open that what you're doing is 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 unfair. Just to use the term of the DMA, that may be a bit outside of just the proper competition uh, rules. Uh, so I think all this would would definitely help. And and the last one, talking about remedies and how to tackle these issues also related to what has been said is to really identify the source of market power. That, that is absolutely key because when we talk about even structural remedies, I'm quite skeptical of some of the remedies. If you look at the stack, you can cut into, I mean, there are two um, ways of, of doing it. Either you separate the advertiser, the ad buying tools from the exchange, or you separate the uh, publisher selling tools from, from the exchange. Um, and again, it has been uh, envisaged by, I'm sure the commission has uh, envisaged both, but, um, but then where to cut is a question, uh, I mean, to know where to cut, you need to know where the source of market power is. And we talk a lot about uh, the ad server on the publisher side because Google has an 80% market share, but I'm not sure this is, I think this is, this is a consequence of market power higher up in the stack where data is that was leveraged into building uh, the, the a, a, an ad server on the publisher side that was dominant and could then favor again uh, the exchange and, and you, know, you have a feedback loop. But you need to know the origin market power if you want to have a remedy that is effective in the long run. And I think looking at user data and maybe advertisers coming to Google in the first place because you also have access to search and YouTube and, and other properties is probably a good start. And that's really important to, to design effective remedies. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Constantina, what is your view on, on, on the capability of, of ex ante rules, not maybe not, not only competition sense, uh, sense of auto, but all other regulatory initiatives to recalibrate the situation significantly and maybe to identify the source of, 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 of the, the upstream source of market power and to, to, chant, to chant. That's, that's a very, that's a very good point raised by um, Kel actually. Uh, so listen, I'm a bit pessimistic about what exante regulation will do to resolve the problem for many different reasons. Uh, starting from the DMA, as Michael mentioned, the DMA establishes a set of transparency obligations 
So for example, under the DMA gatekeepers like Google and Facebook will need to uh, disclose data regarding pricing, regarding fees, regarding the performance of their own um, uh, ad measurement tools. However, if uh, we think about it from the perspective of small advertisers, small advertisers do not have the resources to run their own verification of the inventory. And therefore, uh, according to a recent study that was uh, published on behalf of the commission, many small publishers raised the issue, well, we will continue to use the analytics provided by gatekeepers because we don't have the resources to do it otherwise. So that's one point to discuss. The other point to, to, to raise is that the DMA says nothing about how this data regarding pricing fees and uh, uh, performance of ad campaigns will be uh, provided to advertisers. So even those advertisers that have the resources to uh, uh, run uh, the verification of the ad inventory um, uh, may not be able to do it because it may not be the data may not be provided in a standardized format. So I think that the DMA is far from perfect in that regard, even if, you know, it tries to scratch the surface of the problem in, in, in the sense that it tries to establish some transparency. The other big problem about the DMA is that, you know, it is very prescriptive and therefore, for example, it does not uh, address self preferencing in general. Uh, the DMA establishes a prohibition of self-preferencing in ranking, and therefore it will do nothing to address issues arising from Google's self-preferencing practices in, uh, in ad tech. Uh, therefore, this is uh, where uh, Mikhail's point comes in uh, with respect to the complementarity between competition law enforcement and the DMA. This is also something to, to consider. And of course, we shouldn't forget about the scope of the DMA. The DMA will only apply to gatekeepers. However, as Michael mentioned a few uh, minutes ago at the beginning of, uh, of our discussion, lack of transparency is pervasive in digital advertising. So it doesn't only concern the way Google and Facebook may operate, but it it concerns pretty much how every actor in the industry operates in the sense that there is a considerable information asymmetry that does not concern the big players only. So I think that the DMA is unlikely to move the needle in that regard. Uh, and I'm sorry if I, if I sound a bit pessimistic. Uh, but we shouldn't be forgetting about consumer protection regulation. Um, so again, the DSA, the Digital Services Act, uh, was adopted to address some of the issues that we're discussing here today, for example, dark patterns in terms of how consent is extracted, for example. So the DSA uh, prohibits dark patterns. In theory, it could because the provision is drafted in very broad terms. So in theory, it could capture some of the practices regarding consent extraction. However, uh, the relevant provision of, of the DSA, if I'm not mistaken, it's Article 20 explicitly excludes from its scope practices that fall under the GDPR and the Privacy Directive. So that's not an option. And the other aspect to consider is that according to the DSA, you know, there are some broadly drafted obligations imposed on platforms regarding transparency on targeting parameters, but then the DSA says nothing about how the user is uh, 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 supposed to exercise their rights. And also what happens in terms of enforcement? So the user is not given any option, for example, to change uh, the targeting parameters, but also what if you know the user is not provided any options? How is this going to be enforced in practice? How do we find that an online platform has not complied with these obligations with respect to targeting? And so I think that, you know, regulatory law in principle is a, a, is a, a very good idea if the scope of uh, existing rules, including recently adopted rules, is extended. And I want to refer to one more example because I think it's very important and it's an example that we usually uh, forget about is the example of, uh, that's the example of the platform to business regulation. So the platform to business regulation establishes a set of transparency obligations that apply across the board, right? So the obligation to disclose the main parameters determined meaning ranking. That's relevant to digital advertising and how uh, bids are ranked. A disclosure of uh, uh, terms and conditions, con terms and conditions need to be drafted in clear terms. When there is a suspension of accounts, uh, the uh, platform needs to provide a statement of reasons which by the way was the subject matter of an investigation into online advertising practices by the French Competition Authority and Google was found to infringe competition law on that basis because it suspended arbitrarily advertisers accounts. That was a decision that dates back to 2019. But the big problem with the platform to business regulation is that for some reason it excludes from its scope online advertising exchanges. 
and online intermediation tools. And I'm surprised. Why would, for example, uh, you know, uh, app stores and e-commerce marketplaces and social networks would um, uh, have to comply with these rules, but then online intermediation uh, uh, service providers, for example, digital advertising service providers, do not have to comply with these rules. This is a bit mind-boggling. So, you know, with respect to exempt regulation, we need to consider big issues of scope and also huge gaps in uh, in in the wording of the obligations. Impressive, impressive. Do you, do you have any explanation for this? Or is, is it intentional or just? Uh... Yeah, you know what? I really don't know how to explain it because I worked extensively on the platform to business regulation before it was adopted. And when I saw it in the recitals, I just couldn't believe it. So to me, it does not make sense to exclude from the scope of the instrument anything related to digital advertising when already many competition authorities around the world, including the CMA, had already pointed out all of the problems regarding information asymmetries and the lack of transparency and the issue of ad fraud that was raised by, by Michael. So, so that we, was a fundamental we, problem to be addressed, however it wasn't. <laughs> let's invite our uh, colleagues who, who might be watching this, uh, this conversation to, to, to comment and maybe to, to, to reflect their views on, on, on the reasons. Michael, what is your view on, on the capability of the uh, uh, regulatory mechanisms to recalibrate the situation? And maybe we can also start talking about privacy sand, sandbox as a kind of uh, under the pretext of protecting privacy, don't we somehow move uh, or cement further the, 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 the position, the dominance or the, the super dominance of some players? Yes, yeah, so there's, there's a lot to consider there. Um, I think one thing to note to, to start is that um, uh, some of my pessimism around, pessimism around the Digital Markets Act is because the, the provisions are firstly often quite vague and what will happen I think is that the uh, commission will not uh, have the capacity to clearly design and specify what they're looking for and therefore they will go to the gatekeepers who will then design and specify something that has quite a lot of technical nuance and is advantageous to them and come back and it becomes a bit of a take it or leave it offer um, and so I think it's um, you know the idea of having actually a fiduciary or an internal monitor may have been a better approach as well to continue to co-design some of these approaches going forward um, this is rates for the sandboxes as I think we'll we'll get to another area of my pessimism is if we look at how a company like Google has long operated in the advertising space in a more um, conceptual manner they they operate by moving illegality to the fringes of their network so they extract value by being an intermediary in every transaction but they are effectively encouraging huge amounts of illegality in the real-time bidding market. So other than the fact that I think real-time bidding is quite structurally illegal under data protection law, you have a further problem, which is that um, uh, with a lack of oversight, but the entire also bidding mechanism encourages and incentivizes data management platforms and similar organizations to do very illegal things at the fringes of the network to collect huge and retain huge amounts of bid stream data um, and other kinds of tracking data, which does not have any kinds of legal basis for them to maintain and hold. This is a playbook, and I think the playbook we might see in relation to what Constantina was talking about for the transparency in the DMA. Okay, fine, you don't have the tools to monitor the uh, ad inventory, but what if those tools start to move to the edges of the network outside of the DMA scope? What if actually these, these tools stop being provided or quite central to how Google functions its business, and you instead slip a lot of these functions out of, uh, out of the gatekeeper system and into new forms and new spaces of opacity? So I think there is a lot of this playing you can do by restructuring the network so the DMA is less effective, while the core functionality, which all Google cares about, is really intermediation and getting value from, from advertising transactions, doesn't really mind where it is in the network and how the network is arranged, as long as it is able to extract that value. Digital privacy sandbox is, of course, another method of continuing to extract value in the network, and I think it comes from a lack of enforcement around things like uh, uh, browsers or, com or consideration of com competition of browser market. Let's not mostly forget that Microsoft had to drop its browser engine because it could not afford to continue to develop a separate browser engine. You know, we are in a situation of incredible concentration where we were relying on Mozilla to effectively be the only um, non-large player as providing any diversity in this, in this market whatsoever. 
Um, every jurisdiction I'm aware of in the world, except perhaps Armenia, has Chrome as the largest. And I think if you if you sum up uh, Blink, which is the engine under Chrome, they are all going to be Chromium run browsers. Including so I mean, that's China. The sort of, yes, China is completely completely Chromium. Q browser, Qt browser, and other like these are these are Chromium based. Um, so I think this is sort of the backdrop of Synchronous Sandbox. The other challenge is we are presented with a totally false dichotomy between competition and privacy, like totally false. Um, Real-time bidding system, as I say, is structurally irreconcilable with data protection law and has been for many, many years, and it has been pointed out repeatedly again and again. It is not an option. Like, it is really not an option. Privacy sandbox, as pointed out by, by competition lawyers, is an incredibly problematic approach which disintermediates huge uh, numbers of players and doesn't seem to be very pluralistic in its, um, in its uh, design. We need to think about how do we design an intermediate system which is confidentiality preserving, is steered by more than one actor, uh, like has a sort of plug and play kind of mechanism where there, are, there is actually different, in a way, competition around protocols more than it is around data. Data does not flow freely, but or equally it is not a decision-making about how the infrastructure functions is not centralized in the hands of a single player. No one will put this on the table because Google has no incentive to put this on the table because it does not want to lose its most powerful chip on the web, which is Chrome and power over Chromium and the Chrome browser. Ad tech players, the incumbents, have no incentive to put this on the table because they have no expertise in this area and they have no guarantee that they will continue to exist in that world because they will be moving from a data-centric um, a data centric business model to a protocol-centric business model where they will be thinking of engaging a totally different set of skills and design, right? So we have this ridiculous fake dichotomy that is made by having two actors with no incentive to place any, to, to, to claim it is anything but a dichotomy, right? And I really wanna urge competition, uh, you know, people watching this to not buy into this dichotomy. We need a capacity to design and steer this entire space into a middle zone, but that requires quite a lot of courage and it requires quite a lot of creativity and it requires not taking technical design decisions or technical design visions from incumbent actors who have no incentive to build this. So. You know, competition law has never been afraid to reshape markets where it has been necessary. But the reshaping has happened according to a sort of playbook of potential options of how companies could be arranged that I think are, are quite well known or, quite, or could be quite well envisaged. The problem is I don't think that we're in a situation where that envisaging is very easy because we haven't seen such a system before. And so everybody from regulators to uh, economists to, uh, to, to uh, policymakers will get very timid and judges especially, will get very timid when you're going into that space. So we need to think of what capacities we create there. Um, I don't have the single answer for this. There is a need for a great deal of research in this area, but it needs to be linking research to practice and um, to, to bust some of these myths. But this inevitably requires urges for a much more proactive kind of micromanagerial approach of regulators themselves. They Not only they have to understand, but they all ha also have to have the courage, competences, and uh, sufficient expertise to do it on continuous basis. Who will, who will dare to introduce this in the kind of liberal democratic I, uh, societies? I, I just want, I don't think it's a case of coming in and say specifically, you know, here is exactly what you'll be doing. I think you know, what we don't have is an option on the table in the middle that others can respond to. So the narrative gets broken. If we go in and say, actually, let's have external you know, researchers, civil society companies design the potential schema for an alternative, standards bodies and so on, and imagine what that can be. It becomes something to talk about, to coalesce around, to respond and to change, and to rebut, to go to both Google and the ad tech industry, well, why wouldn't this work? Like, why wouldn't this be a better middle space? And they can say, well, actually, we would have to change this, we would prefer this. So it's a starting point, right? It's not a case of coming in and saying, well, you play this role, you play this role, you're doing this now, you're doing this now, right? But I think that is what we lack in the narrative because we are, it's not a case of saying we, are, we need to be courageous and redesign exactly in that way. We just need to be courageous to have a new type of thing put on the table and a new source of information other than the incumbent actors because neither of them are reaching um, legal or, or otherwise societally satisfactory outcomes. So I think that may be where we need to go next. And you know, the step after that of making that a reality is of course a daunting one, 
but I think we'll become more realistic if we were to go down that road and we'll become much more compatible with a liberal democracy and market democracy and a market economy and so on. I completely agree. I think that that's that's very elegant and and accurate vision. And I think I I, I personally fully subscribe to this to this um, narrative or, or this understanding of 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 the of the future tasks. Mikhail, how how do you see the 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 the, the potential of of privacy sandbox and what should we do with this? Yeah, I'll I'll try and be brief, conscious of of time. But uh, just a couple of reactions. I think given given I mean the ambition here. Uh, how do how can we be effective and I guess to be successful here we need to have some coordination across the regulators that 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 is might, might seem obvious but it's it's we have the European Commission and if we want to be successful we have the DOJ we have the the uh, also the case led by um, attorneys general led by Texas the CMA is also looking into this privacy sandbox is a good example that is dealt by uh, with the, you know the DMU. Um, and that the DMU, so it's not now there is this settlement uh, decision. So you see this mix of tools, uh, regulators looking at, at these issues. And um, given that we need to have, going back to the, the, you know, the empirical evidence we need to build and all the knowledge, we need to share that knowledge. We know it happened before with the CMA talking to the French and sharing even lines of code, looking at bad impressions to understand, understand what is happening. Um, so that is uh, that is central, and then related to privacy sandbox specifically, and and going back to the question of remedies, that's where you can see that you have to be really careful with the remedies because um, one one of the structural remedies was to the was suggested was to to divest uh, the the publisher at server, but what we see with the privacy sandbox uh, in particular is that key functionalities are being moved from the ad server to uh, Chrome or the web browser. So you may divest this, but actually no one cares anymore about the ad server because everything is done within the browser. So that's typically the whack-a-mole dynamic that regulators might be facing. And, and that, that's why you need to anticipate and, 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 and ask the question, where is the source of market power? Could be Chrome, as Michael said, could be the data more generally. What do we mean What access to advertisers? That is the thing. This is what publishers wanted. If you ask publishers what the problem was, they want to make sure they have access to Google's demand. They don't care about the ad server in itself. It's just a set of rules. You know, the, the ad server is just at the end of the day, it's not uh, rocket science. I think it's less indispensable. They just use Google's tools to make sure they have access to Google's demand. And then you have Chrome also playing a big role uh, in there. So that's that that's um, you know, uh, yeah, that that's basically why we need to be careful. And last comment in all this um uh lack of transparency and what was described and we need a new standard you know google itself likens google likens itself to the new york stock exchange uh, and and there was a parallel that was often made with financial markets you would never see that in financial markets that you can organize and participate in, in the auction so that that's probably why structurally there is a there is a problem and indeed it's 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 like many players can 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 act on multiple ways and you have conflicts of interest emerging more generally in the industry and, and not just uh, not not just really to 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 dominant players. I think that's how how DOJ started it's it's very eloquent and very formative case with this comparison uh, with New York Stock Exchange very very accurate and uh, telling message. Constantina I propose we we we, we combine the, uh, your intervention privacy sandbox and maybe also start talking because I'm also mindful of, of your time or of, of participants uh, with other player publishers. Uh, if we look at this kind of fighting fire with fire we need some contravening uh, industry maybe or some players or group of coordination by some who potentially hypothetically can design something of comparable scale and compare of, with maybe different or similar mechanics and it looks that publishers somehow downscaling they are losing competence and interest they are more interested in compensatory mere compensation rather than designing an alternative you you've been dealing with these issues for quite uh, in in your uh, practice and capacity what would be your reflections on on, on this uh, sure, all I said, we'll start from the privacy sandbox case. Uh, and I think I agree with everything that was said by both Michael and Mikhail. And I think it's also important to take a step back and consider what the CMA has done with respect to this case. So listen, I, 
I know the European Commission's practice quite well in the tech space and also in the media space. And I will tell you what the European Commission uh, has been doing in many uh, controversial complex cases where behavioral remedies had to be imposed, right? Which was the case uh, and also in uh, the previous sandbox um, uh, decision. So when, for example, the European Commission had to impose a remedy whereby, for example, the merged entity or uh, the company under investigation for abuse of dominance had to grant access on fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory terms, what it would do is well, it would say, well, and now I leave it on market players, for example, the dominant company that was found to abuse its dominant position or the merging firm to come up with a sensible solution that works for the market. So for example, the commission would not even interfere with the pricing mechanism. Would it be a retail price, a retail minus in the context of front terms? It would not interfere with how, uh, you know, things would work on a day-to-day -day basis. And the result was a complete disaster because of course, the fact that we impose a behavioral remedy on a dominant company does not necessarily reduce the incentive of the dominant company to behave anti-competitively. So there was a lot of you know, deference to, to the companies that had to comply with specific remedies. And you would see how these, uh, how competitors and affected companies would go back to their national competition authorities or the European Commission to complain about the exact same issues. So this is something exposed intervention and then leaving it up to the uh, market players to decide on the mechanics has not worked in practice. What the CMA did in this case is that it intervened in a sense ex ante. So it's a, 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 an example of an abuse of dominance case where you have ex ante intervention because the moment uh, Google announced the, um, uh, the removal or the intention to remove third party cookies, the CMA said, well, wait a minute, we need to discuss the antitrust implications of this practice. And there you had you saw the CMA how um, it developed the case and also how it's involved in the development and design of the commitments uh, before the commitments are implemented. So I think that the CMA from that perspective needs to be commended because we saw the other side of the coin and that has not been effective. Of course, when you take a step back and you say, well, of course, these commitments uh, um, uh, have been proposed by Google and therefore, uh, what does that mean in practice? And I think there are a couple of mechanisms that would, uh, how do I put it, uh, that would prevent abuse. We're not sure how things will work in practice. However, we do have the standstill clause in privacy sandbox. So essentially uh, in that regard, uh, the CMA will have you know, the opportunity to monitor the commitments and the, the final design of the commitments. And then it will have, um, uh, essentially it will allow industry participants to comment on, which of course they can still do. Uh, so um, I think that the solution is being developed by taking into account what the regulator is saying and what the industry is saying. It's far from perfect, but it's better than before. And I think that we need to consider that. Now, with respect to uh, publishers, I think that you're raising a valid point, and I really, I'm also perplexed on this. I really don't know, uh, you know, why uh, uh, another solution that essentially competes with uh, without of the incumbent has been developed yet. Uh, I think that as I was going through the CMA market study earlier today, as I was preparing for the panel, um, uh, uh, to discuss, you know, susceptibility to tipping and all these issues, uh, the CMA had discussed all of these factors that contribute to, to Google's dominance in the area. For example, uh, data advantages, um, uh, you know, the fact uh, that uh, Google is present across the supply chain, these are advantages that publishers cannot duplicate. So if this is essentially uh, how uh, Google uh, uh, has developed its solutions, I don't think that publishers can easily replicate an alternative of the sort. And I think that this is where the problem lies. The other thing to take into consideration, and I think it's a development worth raising, is uh, what was done recently, uh, the joint venture was approved in February 2023. Uh, so it's a joint venture uh, uh, that was uh, uh, notified to the commission by uh, European uh, telecoms uh, and network operators. And essentially, they tried to design a privacy-friendly solution for digital advertising. That's not exactly the same. However, However, uh, what I wanted from a policy perspective, what I wanted to point out is that the commission approved the joint venture. And I think that this is one way in which, you know, we can try to start think of how we can we can create some competition in, in the area or alternative solutions that are, you know, to some extent privacy friendly. For example, that solution that I'm talking about allows for pseudonymization, uh, but also uh, friendly to competition.
in Revelation 1003, it's designed as one, it appears to be designed as one way street. So the incentive, the, inter, the, the remedy should be proposed by, by the company, the, by the, the infringer. And we somehow copy pasted this modality to, to DMA, and we see the same as DMCC bill. So is, is it okay? Is it flexible? If the, is the tool flexible enough to accommodate this regulatory dialogue? And maybe to maybe we need do, do, do the enforcers have sufficient means, procedural means, to introduce to propose the the, the possible remedy uh, in terms of solution, or is it something which requires further amendment? I think that uh, we need to think of it as follows, because many people say that the DMA lacks flexibility. I don't think it does, because we need to think of the um, uh, structure of the DMA. So you have two principles, fairness and contestability, like you have the principle of uh, uh, the competitive process and uh, um, uh, in competition law. So you have the two principles, fairness and contestability, then you have the obligations which are quite prescri prescriptive and then how these obligations are going to be implemented. And there you have the so-called regulatory dialogue for article six and article seven obligations and you have the self-executing obligations of article five. How it will work in practice. First of all, you have the compliance reports, and these will be very similar to the codes of conduct that we will have here in the UK. So essentially, every company will need to tailor the DMA to its own business model, modus operandi, and so on and so forth. And of course, what happens behind the scenes, this is also worth pointing out in terms of uh, you know, remedies, is that the commission is currently having a lot of discussions with the gatekeepers, but also with other industry players, uh, notably gatekeepers business users, Users as to how things should work in practice. So I think that you, we, we may want to consider this as a very long pre-notification period for the DMA. So I think that the mechanism is there. And I think that the commission is also um, has also understood the complexities of implementing the DMA and therefore is trying to do it the right way. Because at the end of the day, this will involve the assessment on may, of many, many technical and commercial issues. So um, to answer your question, I think that the flexibility is there. I think that, of course, the DMA should not be considered as a one-off thing because it will require constant dialogue. In fact, through the compliance reports that need to be submitted on a regular basis, the Commission will always have the opportunity to adjust them. So I think that the core issue is not the fact that the DMA lacks flexibility, is about the point that you raised about the resources and the expertise. And I think that this is a very crucial point. I will just give you one example. <clears throat> which by the way is related to issues regarding digital advertising. So the famous article 5.2 obligation, right? Data combination should not be allowed unless users grant their consent. The consent needs to be compliant with the GDPR. Great. I mean, I can talk about the obligation for hours, but for the purposes of your question, who is going to check compliance with the GDPR? Is it going to be the commission? No. Is it going to be the high level group for the DMA, which includes data protection authorities, the European Data Protection Board? No, because if you go through the relevant provision regarding the high level group, this is supposed to be giving advice and recommendations to the commission about high level issues with respect to how the DMA is going to be implemented, general issues regarding consent instruction. And we've all seen how the GDPR has been enforced. So I'm gonna leave that issue on the side. But even if the commission were willing to do it, if, it, if it's not a competent data protection authority, how is it going to do it? So do we have, you know, the, the, the relevant expertise at the commission to be conducting these assessments on a day-to-day -day basis? This, to me, is a big question that needs to be resolved. And that's only one obligation, one aspect of the relevant obligation. So if we discuss, you know, 100 officials, 150, of, I don't know how many there are going to be, even if the DMA allows for flexibility and it allows for making sure that the compliance reports are tailored or the DMA is tailored to the compliance reports of the gatekeeper concern, there is going to be a huge issue on enforcement there that we need to consider. Well, just one thing I, I would mention, because I think it was often misunderstood in terms of remedies and whether the remedies are coming from, from the companies, I think we can just look at what happened in the French case where Google proposed remedies, but because it was a settlement decision that there was not even a market test. And it seems that the European Commission is considering that these remedies are completely ineffective. So maybe that, that is an indication that when you know, the, the company is 
designing the remedies, it, it doesn't really work. So you should at least have some kind of dialogue and, and market test of these, of these remedies. That was a huge point uh, that was being discussed uh, in the process of adoption of the DMA, <clears throat> sorry, to make sure that business users can actually influence the drafting of the compliance reports, participate in the regulatory dialogue. I think that we are trying to learn from these experiences from the competition law enforcement side. And, 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 and maybe what one it makes me think of something else, you know, what we are saying is it's very difficult to sort of uh, design and, and design the rules directly, but what we want to have is design a framework when where you can have a solution emerging. And just it makes me think we're talking about publishers or just drawing a, a parallel with pay for content because I think pay for content is interesting because it's very hybrid between uh, sort of pure regulation. We don't want to set a price to the you know content and the, the, what is the price of an article. On the other hand, we know that there is an imbalance of bargaining power between say platforms, big platforms and, and publishers. And there was this idea of sort, of sort of designing the rules with this final offer arbitration that has been uh, uh, implemented in Australia, uh, some different rules with also arbitration in France where- And in the UK help, now. And in the with... UK, exactly. In the UK, the MCCBL, you see that it definitely inspired, it's less precise at this point. It's gonna be interesting to see how it is done exactly because I think the joint advice from the CMA and Ofcom that was published uh, already a while back was exploring many different things, but it was not so clear. So you could tell they were like sort of uh, trying to 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 uh, uh, get the inspiration from the France, Australia, get the best from all uh, these cases. But but the point is, it, what we're trying to do is design the institutional framework where you can rebalance the negotiating uh, the bargaining power between publishers, news publishers, and platforms, and then you let them negotiate because it's just too difficult to do that on behalf of, of everyone. So it's just, you want to, to sort of uh, set the rules. And this is what we are kind of saying here is that you can't just deal with all requests from everyone and then design yourself. You just want to have this forum, these rules where hopefully uh, you rebalance a bit the, the, the market power across across and the incentives so that the solution will emerge from competition negotiation in this case. But it, you can't just set the price. You want to stay away from, from this because we know that there are all sorts of adverse effects if you, if you, if you just decide uh, as a regulator directly. I fully agree that we need the framework. We cannot really set the price. What is fair remuneration to one publisher may not be to another. Uh, it reminds me of the other nightmare provision of the DMA Article 612, you know, uh, access to the app store on fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory terms. Let's see how that is going to be enforced by the commission. Um, but I think that uh, uh, Mikel is absolutely right. Uh, we need a framework, a framework that works well. And this goes back to the point on enforcement. You need an active regulator to intervene where things go back. And I think that all this, this is not something, you know, groundbreaking when we consider the media industry, because Ofcom has done it for years in the context of, for example, the prominence regime, the must carry, must offer regime. So, you know, it's something that was done in the past by many regulators. And therefore, you know, the only thing that changed is the actors involved in the negotiations. So when a framework exists, a framework that works relatively well, and you have a regulator that really understands how the markets work in practice, I think it's feasible to be uh, to achieve a very good solution for everyone. In terms of alternatives, I think, alternative um, infrastructures are going to be key to envisage and we will need to think of capacities in the whole digital landscape to imagine alternatives from a point of of no conflicts of interest or fewer conflicts of interest and that is going to be something that as the other two panelists emphasize needs collaboration between multiple regulators and multiple um, domains i don't think that we can um, uh, you know consider the sort of digital and political future in a way from just a single point of view, it has to be quite coherent, but that might be call, a call for regulators to have a shared capacity um, for, for industry, society, politicians, uh, academia to come together to, to discuss, well, what potential futures could there be and what is a research project for um, understanding this? Because one challenge we have right now is that people can say, we should change it in this way, we should change it in this way, we should go in this direction or that direction. And industry comes back and says, well, that isn't coherent or that wouldn't work for X and Y situation. And it becomes just a bit of a, a, a tense conversation. I'd like to get away from that so we have visions that we can work towards that are both technically sensible 
uh, workable and represent the most the widest variety of interests possible. Yeah, I think I mean to um, yeah, uh, I mean, a couple of comments on this. I think it's very difficult for publishers to to be honest. I'm quite skeptical that they could recreate this for two main reasons. From what we've been saying is that the first one is that the, because of this self referencing and and um, the the fact that. Well, Google has been able to sort of build a moat around the ad tech stack. If you want to compete, you really have to recreate something similar. So you have to enter at every level of the of the of the stack. That makes it quite difficult. And then we go back to the question of where the the, the, the market power was uh, originating from. And if if it's access to data, although they have access to uh, inventory, it's very, they won't have access to to user data in the same way as as Google. So. It, it, it may, like rivals, maybe may have been struggling. Um, publishers would also be struggling to just say, "Well, we need to, we can just create our own uh, uh, intermediary uh, tools." Um, so, I mean, you could have a change of, it could trigger a change of business model, and this is what we've been seeing to a certain degree. It's like we need, we need something, something different. It depends what this alternative is because uh, it cannot be a solution. So, for example, just to say, well, I'm going to rely less on advertising and I'm going to be behind a paywall, it can work for some publishers. I don't think it can be a solution because we, we do need to have free quality uh, press uh, uh, you know, for, for all. If we, in my case, I mean, you pay with, with your data, as we know, it's never really free. But anyway, we can't, it can't, cannot be a, a, a substitute uh, in general. So, yeah, I don't think it, it is it is very uh, easy for for publishers to just come up with uh, an alternative. And do you think regulators and enforcers can cooperate interjurisdictionally, like UK and EU, for example? I mean, meaningfully, not just uh, like discussing common themes. That that's that's the hope, uh, and at least when it comes to these, uh, you know complicated uh, analysis it's very easy to share once you've written a line of code or piece of code uh, in like in econometrics you can share it very easily with, with other regulators and i know that this has happened to a certain degree uh, but it it should become a habit i, I guess uh, uh, for students i i'd say that it's a really difficult space to to grasp because the supply chain is so complicated um, and it's so it's so varied. Um, you know, what, one thing I would you know, resist dichotomies and challenge sort of orthodoxy when people suggest that certain areas are impossible or not. For example, one thing is to maybe imagine how this might play out in the next saga that that will occur inevitably after this. You know, how should all the regulators be involved? We're very, very reliant now. It shows the third party cookie deprecation saga has shown how reliant we are on platforms to do basic enforcement of privacy law. We might not be in this situation had we had a very different kind of discussion and shaping and dynamic and had forced rethinking by the industry of how this might look over a series of years. I think that is going to be a key thing to try and study to think in the future, how would we do institutional design that stops us coming to a, a point of loggerhead or crisis where fake or false dichotomies, I think, can get presented. Recommendations for students. So two of them. First of all, uh, I always like to tell my students that when it comes to competition, the sky's the limit, uh, especially now, out of all times, especially now. Uh, why? Because uh, there are so many important societal issues to consider with respect to competition law enforcement, especially competition law enforcement in digital markets. Now, uh, Michael mentioned that, especially with respect to digital advertising, the value chain is very complex, and this might be discourage students. However, I do need to propose a solution for that problem because there are many studies now, including the CMA's market study, that explains how the value chain, the supply chain works, including the bidding uh, uh, mechanism, and that is done fairly well. So if you want to delve into these issues, you can do it fairly easily by being very focused on, you know, uh, those studies that have been published. When I was, you know, when I was writing my PhD thesis, I essentially had access to the commission decisions and and OECD policy roundtable papers. And that was pretty much it. But since then, a 
lot of you know interesting market studies have emerged that discuss how the markets work in practice and that's really fascinating because you don't need to rely on another trust decision to understand how the market works it's done through the market studies and uh, other important um, uh, reports in this area one other with respect to digital advertising one other important study is uh, the study uh, to which i referred a commission by the commission uh, that was published in january 2023 and it discusses the state of digital advertising across the eu and that's also very comprehensive now with respect to the future though i think that this is a very interesting time to discuss competition law and regulation of digital markets and um, uh, you know from my experience in private practices in house counsel uh, there are so many things that students can do if they decide to devote uh, their, uh, themselves to that area they can be in-house and they can be in-house with respect to you know competition law compliance issues but also dma compliance issues you know, or DSA compliance issues. There are so many different instruments that they can work on. And this is a fascinating area from, you know, the perspective of private practitioner. I mean, you know, there are days I go from the AI Act to the Copyright Directive to competition law because they're all interlinked. And therefore, if you decide to, to practice in this area, you will learn so much and you will be able to understand the market really, really well. So I think that, you know, if uh, the CMA, of course, and other competition authorities offer traineeship opportunities and uh, and uh, graduate re recent graduate schemes so that's also definitely something to explore I, I just think that it's very ex it's these are very exciting times to work in the competition sphere in general if you do uh, economics about my, my field because uh, what I can see is that you have you're, you're really dealing with these um, very important issues. And at the same time, you have access to a lot of information, typically have access to the top management within companies and access to data that, that you can use to really uh, demonstrate the issues and identify solutions. So this is also the sort of the new, we can see a new movement. So either in the private practice or within regulators, I think the CMA recent data conference was fascinating. Uh, and you can see they are building data architecture, thinking about how to uh, really be um, sort of data driven, but but just have the infrastructure around it. Could be through cloud as well, cloud services or anything. But you really need to 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 have that uh, to deal with these complex issues, either through competition law or uh, through regulation. And the good thing with this movement, I think, is that it will attract students because before, if you wanted to do these exciting things as maybe a data scientist or a statistician, uh, economist, econometrician, you would you had to go to big tech because this is where the exciting stuff was happening, uh, where you had access to data. So it was already a bit antique already. They had a very, you know, in terms of bargaining power, they had a lot more to offer to students. And then the best maybe were going there just because it was exciting. I think this is changing a bit, which is great because if, if regulators and, and the competition agencies can compete, showing how cool the stuff they are able to do are, <laughs> uh, it, it, will, it will also help you know, design the, the, the future and solve uh, some of these, some of these issues. Michael Will, Michael Harva, Konstantin Abania, thank you very much for sharing your brilliant ideas with us today.